Here is a picture of the first Porsche 911 in 1963, which was actually called the 901. It was designed by Ferdinand Bootsy Porsche, who is the grandson of Ferdinand Porsche, the famed designer of the Volkswagen Beetle. Bootsy's design essentially lasted until 1993, when it changed with the 964. With that car, they updated a bunch of the components, but they kept the overall shape and form the same even after that. From its inception, the Porsche 911 has historically been one of the most popular sports cars of all time. One of the big reasons for its popularity is as Ferdinand Porsche puts it himself, the 911 is the only car you could drive on an African safari or at Le Mans, to the theater or through New York City traffic. Over the years, the Porsche 911 has been used for rallying, racing, and even grocery getting. Through each iteration, many components have changed, like the engine, the suspension, and so much more. But there's one element of its design that has remained largely the same, and it's an unnoticed pillar of the Porsche's signature style. The A, B, and C pillars of a car are the vertical supports of the upper window area of the car, commonly referred to as the greenhouse. The design and positioning of these pillars determine the form of the greenhouse and vary depending on the intended function of the vehicle. SUVs have taller, more vertical pillars, while sports cars have longer, more aerodynamic, horizontal pillars. The first two cars that ever existed were based on horse and buggy, so they were made out of wood and had no roof. It wasn't until the turn of the century that we actually began to see more roofs on cars, but they were mostly canvas or leather. Then this guy came around. Edward Budd was a steel manufacturer from rural Delaware. He had helped create the first steel pulley, which revolutionized factories around the globe. After that initial success, he set his sights on automobiles. He set up shop in a small rented building, but he didn't have enough room for all of his equipment, so he had to buy a circus tent to put up outside to cover his large steel stamping press. His goal was to take the wooden auto bodies of the time and turn them into all metal welded bodies. To do this, he had to design and create his own tools that could weld and roll the steel into the shapes that they needed. Nobody had ever done that before. Three years after Bud started his company, he was almost bankrupt until he got a call from a small company called the Dodge Brothers. The Dodge Brothers company called and ordered 5,000 all metal welded bodies. They later upped that order to 50,000. This was right around the time that they became the third largest auto manufacturer in the US, and I'm sure you've heard of them. Get that winning feeling with great cars, trucks, and service at your local Dodge dealer. Bud and Dodge had some crazy ideas of how they could market these new all metal welded bodies. Bud took a full grown elephant and put it on the roof of one of his cars just to prove its strength. One of the crazy ways that the Dodge brothers tried to market these new all metal welded bodies was taking a stunt driver and driving one of these cars off of a cliff. The car rolled multiple times and then the stunt driver was able to get out and show that he was safe and alive and they drove the car back that day. By the year 1916, Bud Manufacturing was producing 5,000 auto bodies a day. With the creation of all metal bodies, cars began to take on all new forms. Like this iconic style from the 1920s, the turret top, which not only looked good, but added rigidity to the car's frame. In decades following, designers began to pen new shapes. The greenhouses became sometimes rounder, sometimes taller. All were becoming more individual and unique. Eventually getting us to this, the Porsche 356, which was designed by Bootsy's father, Ferdinand Ferry Porsche, with the body designed by Porsche employee Erwin Comenda. The 356's design was heavily influenced by its predecessor, the Volkswagen Beetle, and it actually was built using a lot of Volkswagen Beetle parts. You can even see that influence today with every Porsche that's come out since the 356. After a few years, the 356 became a pretty popular car, and as the flagship model, it was the thing that Porsche was known for. 
After a few years of production, Ferry Porsche decided that it was time to replace the 356 with a new model. Many designers inside of Porsche and outside submitted designs, but they were all rejected, either being too close to the 356 or not close enough to the Porsche distinct style. In December of 1959, Bootsy Porsche completed a full design prototype of the replacement for the 356. And in 1963, the new flagship model for Porsche was born, the Porsche 911. The design was a modified body of the 356 with the signature sloping back end and a new longer hood that gave it a more aerodynamic silhouette. When we look at Porsche's design throughout the years, we can see a real effort put into maintaining that distinct form that came from the 356. Take any model year of the 911 and you can see the huge influence that that first model in 1963 made on every model ever since. And the Porsche designers take very good care to keep that same iconic silhouette, but to update things, little pieces, to make the design feel modern and fresh. One of the elements that they use to keep that iconic style are the car's A, B, and C pillars. Now, as I said, I'm not trying to suggest that pillars are the only thing that keep the 911 style intact. They're far from it. But it is an important detail to note, and you can look at it and see how different designers use pillars to mark or brand a car and differentiate a whole line of cars. Let's take a look at some of the pillars throughout the years of the 911. You can notice how these pillars in a rudimentary sketch can kind of give you an idea of the whole entire shape of the car. And it's not just Porsche that uses their pillars as a specific design element to brand or design a car. Notice the way the rear window is shaped on this BMW, or on this one, or even this one. This little cutout of the C-pillar actually has a name. It's called the Hofmeister Kink, and it's named after Wilhelm Hofmeister, who was the head of design of the BMW from 1955 all the way to 1970. And they've used that little design element as a mark for BMW ever since. Let's look at another example. This is the Ford Mustang pillar design throughout the years. And as I said before, you can really see the whole design of the car just from these three lines. And it hasn't changed that much. Now let's look at Tesla. Here are a few different models from their current lineup. You can see that the pillars all look pretty similar. This is an example of using pillars to set apart a whole brand or lineup of cars. Over the years, car pillars have totally changed. And I'm not suggesting that they're the only or most important element of a car's design, but with good design, every line counts. Hey, I'm Ben. I'm the host of Voltage. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing and checking us out on our website. Thanks.